Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Okay. This is day four of COP. Welcome. Uh, I am Cristina Gamboa. I am the CEO of the World Green Building Council. With you here all today. And today is a very special day for World GPC and its network. We're launching the much anticipated report called Beyond the Business Case. So, for those of you that may be unfamiliar with our work, the World Green Building Council is the strongest local, regional, global action network driving sustainability in the built environment. We're a network of over 70 Green Building Councils around the world, and there's 36,000 members. Together, we're working with businesses, governments, to catalyze the uptake of sustainable buildings for everyone everywhere. So, today, in this session, we have it packed with highlights and insights from our new report, and we're very pleased to have an incredible group of speakers with us today. Joining me the session today, uh, starting, we're gonna have my dear friend, James Drinkwater from the Lotus Foundation to provide some opening remarks. James is the head of Built Environment at Lotus Foundation, and he'll be discussing the importance of the built environment to address its impacts. After we have heard from James, I will take us through a preview of the report and its findings. Then later, we will discuss with our wonderful panel the, about the value proposition uncovered in our report and its potential for the impact in our sector. We will hear from Maria Fernanda Aguirre. She is the CEO of the Chile Green Building Council. She will be joining us virtually from Santiago de Chile. We have here with us today Chris Trott, partner and head of sustainability at Foster and & Partners. And finally, we're very pleased to have here today Rachel Skinner. She is the UK Executive Director for WSP and a World GBC board member. Thank you very much to all of you for being with us today. And now I'm gonna pass the stage to James Drinkwater, who will be addressing us. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Christina. And I'm looking forward to being with you all in Glasgow very soon, but for now, just virtually. And I have to say to, to the whole team involved in this report, the Lattice Foundation is extremely proud to be able to support it. If it's even just half as impactful as the predecessor report on the business case for green building some years ago that really shaped industry narrative across the globe on the topic, if it's even half that impactful, it's going to make an enormous difference to the sector and a sector which is responsible for 38 percent of all global emissions and thankfully finally to, to yourselves and, and the coalition of people who've come to the table uh, to represent the sector at COP it's finally being taken to the climate ball as a sector that actually represents I think some of the, the hugest opportunities to mitigate climate change. Um, and at the Laudis Foundation, we're a philanthropic foundation. We often talk about three things that are needed to help really systemic shifts in industry and no less is needed here in the built environment. We talk about the need to reshape ideas and narratives. We talk about the need to reshape power and we talk about the need to reshape incentives. Now, in terms of reshaping ideas and narratives, I am thrilled that this report is starting to really create a new bolder narrative, not just around why it's nice to do a little bit better, what's the business case for incrementalism. It's, it's really marking a line in the sand and saying absolutely firmly, we have to decarbonize, we have to transition or companies will die. It, it's really now that the moment has shifted in terms of that, that broader narrative on, it's nice to do a little bit better to you cannot afford not to make this transition with us. I think narratives are absolutely critical. They're getting ever bolder and they must really challenge and inspire the level of action that we need now in industry. And in terms of reshaping power, I think it's crystal clear at this COP, and indeed to many of us, it's been clear for many years that the kind of transition envisaged by leaders in the business community, in the political community and the financial community simply isn't tenable. It's not going to happen. 
unless we walk down that path with the communities who live in our homes, who live in, live in our cities. And so the report's focus on social value is again absolutely critical. Alongside this journey on carbon, it's absolutely critical that we do more now on the social side of sustainability. Again, the transition will be made impossible if we don't have that focus. And it's critical if we're looking towards, say, embracing a circular construction economy as we look at what the Paris Agreement needs of us, that we ensure that the jobs in that circular construction economy are good jobs, that as we're renovating millions of dwellings around the world, we're not creating renovations. That social value of what we do as we deeply decarbonize is absolutely central. And lastly, in terms of reshaping incentives, I am incredibly inspired by the work that the World Green Building Council and many of its partner organizations have done on the pathway to this COP. And it's my hope that the kind of bold action that this report calls on is heard by the parties to the Paris Agreement, that the support that your business community is showing uh, is seen by the political community and that your partners, your coalition, help us achieve some of that regulatory change that is needed to make this movement absolutely unstoppable. A fantastic report. I hope everyone in the audience reads it and thrilled to hear from our other speakers today. Back to you, Christine. Thank you very much, James. Amazing to kick us off in this presentation. So this year, World GPC team has worked really hard with the support of these incredible partners, including Lotus Foundation, to explore the current and future business case for a sustainable built environment. The work is critical. Not just for today, as James was saying, but during COP26, we're going into cities, regions, and built environment day on November 11th, and it's really an important moment, as James was saying also, to uh, have this topic high up in the agenda and hopefully as, as we go into the future process of COPS, hopefully it will be also be in the political negotiation agenda. Because the built environment, including both buildings and infrastructure, accounts for 75% of global emissions and we know that a powerful business case will be essential to drive the necessary investment in more sustainable practices. So this is a slide of 2013's report. So if you're taking pictures, wait for the next one. Because this one in 2013, the business case for green buildings, uh, actually we, we did also get in the journey of updating this report because um, last year I was in, in, an, in another meeting online and I saw that people still used graphics from this 2013 report. And so much has changed, so much changed and there's so much momentum. And uh, there's more, more compelling evidence than back then. The evidence is undeniable, so in our new report, we just don't present to you with why you should invest in a sustainable built environment. We demonstrate why you can't afford not to. So, next year is World GBC's 20th year anniversary, and during these two decades, our global sector has been seeing that the building and construction industry can increase its awareness about sustainability and begin to quantify the broader value of building assets because we're running out of time. This awareness must convert into action. And that, it, it, that is what also inspired this report beyond the old graphics. Decision makers need more evidence-based intelligence and the financial and non-financial drivers for sustainable buildings. And that is exactly what we did. So this report draws and embraces from the rapidly growing sustainability agenda across the built environment, the evolving scope of sustainability, broadening of what's called green, and aligning much closer with the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. But also, and I've been on this slide for a few minutes because the rise in social value as not just a consideration, as some nice to have, is actually a critical business driver for developers and investors. And the urgency today for this report is greater than what it was in 2013, because we all know the stakes are much higher. So this is the new report. The scope of sustainability is expanding 
and considering only buildings is not no longer enough. Because since the launch of our report Beyond Buildings, just a few week, weeks ago, we said, okay, let's signal that the increased consideration of infrastructure alongside buildings is a necessity and we need an integrated approach to the entire built environment. So the new report builds on the 2013 report and builds on this one that we released last week. And they complement each other. They talk to each other because they outline how we can accelerate to a more sustainable built environment. The work we've done to get to Beyond the Business Case Report has been a truly collective effort as <laughs> the built environment transformation needs to be across our global network and of course supported by a fantastic task force of green building councils that I know are with us online from all geographies. We also welcomed and were very privileged to have leading private sector organizations like Foster and Partners, Lent Lease, CBRE, Sangoban, Kingspan, Mott McDonald, Johnson's Controls, Bureau Hapold, and SOM. Also, we were delighted really delighted to work with NGOs like the Institute for Human Rights and Business. And finally, a huge special thanks to our consultants, consultants from WSP who kindly worked pro bono on this report. And also deep gratitude to the funders, Lotus Foundation. So let us introduce to you the 2021 beyond the business case report. And I'm gonna take you through a, some of, of its key highlights. Throughout the report, you will find seven irrefutable co-benefits for investing in a sustainable built environment because we demonstrate that they are right. They cr cut across both the financial and the value, the, the, bis the social value case. So you can see around the wheel, but basically they are social benefits to buildings occupants, occupants through health, productivity, and well-being. Second, lower or equivalent costs at supply chain, construction, and operational phases. So you see here we're bringing in whole life into consideration. Risk mitigation, providing resiliency to inevitable climate impacts, environmental environmentally and financially, as well, of course, future proofing against legi legislative change or corporate expectations or and reputational risk. A higher assets, higher asset value, sorry, link both to performance and asset desirability. Finally, uh, two, no, two more, investment opportunities. There are seven. <laughs> Through a rapidly and transitioning financing sector that is both protecting investments, supporting the share, share prices, of course, and increasing requirements on ESG, environmental and social governance reporting. Access to finance. Due to the availability of finance for green buildings from banks, bonds, and institutional investors. And finally, the wider role of business that organizations recognize their responsibility to engage with the sustainable development movement, including beyond uh, environmental action and social value, and they have to go beyond just considerations than broader profit margins. So within the content of this, of this report, we also go deep into what's the current financial business case, which was most of the, also of the core 2013 report. And we explored there the drivers that are now fueling this transition like the commitments, the pledges that countries do, the nationally determined contributions. There was a huge increase in this round of improvements mentioning buildings across NDCs uh, throughout the world. Regulatory change that is happening, like the EU taxonomy, the rise in sustainable finance, and the growth, of course, of ESG requirements that I already mentioned. But of course, on top of that, the basis of optimal economic opportunity from greater access to investment, corporate reputation, higher asset value, and investment resilience. Of course, there still is the case for lower build and operational costs and returns on investment from 
occupant productivity. This report also gives equal weighting for the first time, as I said, to social value. So World GPC presents the contextual factors driving the rise in social value, very much worked upon the great work of UK GBC in this space, from the COVID-19 pandemic to both the private and public sectors, such as policy or procurement. We also outline in the report the social value case at three scales of action. First, from health and well-being at the building occupant level, two, the benefits at jobs, creating jobs at the local level, two, importantly, international human rights and welfare recognition throughout the construction life cycle and materials supply chain. So, we're gonna share now with you a case study. There are several throughout the report, so we invite you to explore them. Here we're gonna highlight one that shows us the achievability of what I just described. And this real life case study is, is gonna be, I think, very much of your interest. We have here Foster and Partners with us today, and, was, and, and, one, and we would like to especially highlight this project, Acciona Bamboo, it's a development in Madrid. The restoration of an abandoned listed industrial building is an excellent example of the business case for sustainable building. So from the financial perspective, FMP calculated the energy efficiency and renewable generation to save 3.5 million euros over the life cycle of the building and also massively increase the asset value. And in terms of social value, it provided community benefit by creating a positive multiplier effect in previously deprived area and specifically created like 800 jobs in the local community. So it's a great example also of the circular economy in action principles into practice, and to hear much more from it, uh, I invite uh, Chris Strott uh, in a second to uh, join us for the panel. But before that, you're going to see this in the report, and I think it's going to be really interesting for you to consider. So with WSP, we worked on using, using modeling uh, based on the IPCC-aligned 2050 future scenarios we modeled and undertook a series of sessions to, with a task force of the report run by WSP to figure out what would it be, what would the business case look like under different climate stresses. Mm -hmm. So we both considered a 1.5 degree scenario and we considered a three degree scenario of warming as well as world, at the worlds where what would that impact in terms of health and social value? If they're not priorities, what would it happen? So the outcomes of that big exploration signal that the value proposition for investment in our long-lasting built assets remain very strong. And when you look at the stresses of the, of the, of the, mo of the worst impacts, the, conclude, the, re the research really concludes that. Global health and well-being, hmm? that focus will mean that ESG performance, reputation, and public perce perception grow in importance for all asset classes as we become more stressed. This extends to public buildings due to political pressure. And that even in a 1.5 degree scenario, there will be impact still from extreme weather on buildings and infrastructure. So sustainable assets that are more resilient and lower cost from climate impacts will be future proofed to that variations we will see in the future. So, we're inviting you, as you join us today, uh, to call for deep and unprecedented collaboration because we need multi-stakeholder action across the value chain to make this happen. Doing this will allow us to unlock both the commercial benefits, the resiliency that people and planet needs too. I think, we think, it's a necessary step change towards more equitable societies, living in a healthy and regenerating planet. So this report, we believe, has answers for those people that are in a decision-making spot in the world. And we can confidently say you cannot afford not to invest in sustainability. It's not only now the, the ethical thing to do. We're beyond that point. It's also what we demonstrate. It's a sound business strategy from a financial, risk mitigation 
or future-proofing perspective. So now I've taken you through the report. That's enough for me for the time being, and I would like to dive in with our wonderful panelists on this topic. Uh, oh, sorry, no, wait. We have first one online, sorry. We're all learning this hybrid model. And uh, we're inviting Maria Fernanda Aguirre from Chile to join us. So, Maria Fernanda, this report considers all aspects of the broader value proposition as a financial business case is strengthening. Why is it crucial from your perspective to take a holistic view on the need for a sustainable built environment? Hi, Cristina. Good morning from Chile. Um, first of all, thanks so much for the invitation. I will have loved to be there, you know, in Glasgow, reality set and other things. So uh, I'm connected from, from here from Chile. And it's very interesting, you know, your question, because um, we as Chile DBC, uh, it's funny because we were in charge of the translation of the first report that you showed that was uh, delivered on 2013. Um, and as you mentioned, we have, you know, we, we still see that this report is, uh, is uh, you know, part of many of the information that even, for example, companies in Chile and Latin America use. Um, but something that I like very much about you know the report that we are launching today is that for years we have been focused on providing only energy solutions you know efficiency solutions to reduce the consumption of building during the operation stage um, and although it continues to be a reality in some developing countries um, we see now that you know uh, it has begun to change and, and we see for example now that countries in Latin America such as Costa Rica, Colombia and Chile uh, have ambitious decarbonization goals and very specific roadmaps, uh, roadmaps sorry and strategies uh, for the construction sector. Um, however, we cannot deny that the pandemic revealed critical equality of life situations uh, that must be addressed urgently. Um, and we are not only talking about, you know, uh, the, the availability of housing and the deficit that we see, for example, in underdeveloped countries and, and, and you know, in developing in development countries as well, um, which is, a, you know, a main problem for the most vulnerable population. And we see also, you know, deficit in terms of of um, quality, which are the minimum standards that we must set um, for, you know, people uh, in, in, in vulnerable, you know, situation and also, you know, for people which, which are living um, as a uh, in, you know, in a very critical situation as a, as a result of the pandemic. So we uh, must start talking, you know, about uh, thermal comfort, visual, acoustic, and also about um, safe public spaces with vegetation and areas for social and cultural integration. This is something that I have been addressing, you know, in 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 in, in, my, in my last presentations, and that we as Chile TBC has been promoting, you know, very um, we, we very hard, you know, during during all, all, all of our activities, um, and because we think that uh, you know this social and cultural integration um, is very very important, and also the report covers it very, very very well so um in these recent years we have countries that have been hit not only you know by the pandemic uh but also you know but uh, this social crisis and and, and and i think that something that this report has that it, it, that is very you know strong is this a uh, call to to make you know an urgent call for international finance support. Um, I, I think that you saw, you know, I, I don't remember if it was like last week or, or you know, during, the, during these last days, this huge um, news, you know, about this lobby that some of the countries, you know, were um, carrying out related, for example, to meat consumption and also to financiation, you know, for um, underdeveloped countries. So um, I think that this uh, COP26, you know, is key for this call. So, um, you know, we want, you know, these uh, development, you know, these developed countries, which are, you know, result also to be, you know, the bigger emitters to, to support underdeveloped countries, because there is no way that we can fight, you know, climate change without solving, you know, our inequity problems. So um, we need also, you know, local governments to uh, take, to make decisions based, of course, of, on science, because it's very important, but also, you know, based um, on the solution of problems that will arise as a result of massive displacements and we need these solutions to be with gender's perspective protection of childhood and also you know age patterns 
as a result, you know, of, of less, of less, you know, birds and, and people living, you know, longer. Um, the transition to sustainable built environment must not focus only on emissions. Uh, it also has to incorporate other, you know, uh, variables such as loss of biodiversity, poverty, scarcity of resources, access to goods and services, and also health and inequality. And, you know, finally, I want to say that um, this report is, as you mentioned, Christina, very linked to the first report that was launched on 2013. But um, for us, uh, the chance to be part of the task force was amazing because it uh, helped like to, to showcase uh, the real problems that we face in terms not only, you know, of emissions, you know, um, but, but also, you know, to the social impact that everything is going to have in the future, not in the future, in the very close future, you know, we're starting now. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you very yes, much, I can Maria hear you. Fernanda. Fantastic. Yes, and also Maria Fernanda's perspective here is very important because the world is big and wide, right? And that consideration of inequality, poverty, the moment we're facing in the world, the, we, as we evolve, it's not only mitigation, it's not only savings and doing a little bit better. We're now flipping that argument and social value, again, is, is at the core no, of this report. And, and Maria Fernanda's voice is that of the Global South. And that is very important to hear it out and comprehend because we need also solidarity beyond geographies uh, to learn to leapfrog and get this right quickly. So Chris, to you, what sorts of measures can clients and designers employ today? that can deliver a resource conscious development that is fit for the future. So, <clears throat> thanks uh, for inviting me to, to be here, uh, Christian. Before I answer that, I just want to say it's been a pleasure to be involved in this. It's been a pleasure to be on the task group putting it together. Uh, and also, it's been a, a real pleasure to work on this um, 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 wonderful Axiona project that, uh, that uh, you put up earlier and, uh, and, and the foresight that our client had. Uh, in buying this fantastic site. Um, I mean, one of the things that we do find, uh, the more that we look at existing buildings, is how much sense it makes to retain and to love existing buildings and to convert them uh, for additional use. Um, it's, it's seldom that we find an existing building where the right answer is to knock it down and to replace it and look at a whole life cycle carbon um, uh, improvement. Uh, they're almost always better to, to love existing buildings. So I think that's the first thing that, that we would say. Um, so we were challenged with this particular building to um, not just bring it back into use. It was in a, a very rundown part of Madrid. Uh, it was in no way a destination. Um, uh, it wasn't a place that you even walked through, you avoided. Um, and um, uh, an old industrial facility um, uh, built in 1905 and, and, and in uh, disuse for some considerable time. So um, what we did is we, we looked at the building and, and we realized quite quickly that the, the, the actual fundamental structure of it, which was a masonry structure, was a strong structure, although it was a bit tired uh, and um, most of the roof uh, itself was dilapidated, but the structure holding it up was, uh, was pretty sound. So we, we retained the existing um, uh, masonry, uh, 10,000 square meters of, um, uh, uh, sorry, 10,000 tons of masonry was retained, uh, cleaned up and brought back into use. Um, and we put a new roof covering on, but we, uh, we tidied up all of the existing um, uh, structure uh, holding up the roof. Now those two measures alone, uh, in terms of the structure, uh, saved around about 30% of the carbon that would have been used if we'd replaced that structure. And for the wall-in, that was closer to 50% uh, of the uh, carbon that would have, been, um, um, uh, would have been brought into the atmosphere if we knocked it down and, and, and used it again. So huge um, uh, climatic uh, improvements from that point of view. Um, Whilst doing that, of course, we've improved the energy performance of the building. We, re we replaced the old windows. The, the building is uh, a lot more airtight than it was now. Um, and by doing that, we think that we've reduced the um, energy on a on a year by year consumption basis about 35% in comparison to what might be another baseline, which directly re you know re re results in about 35% energy uh, cost reduction on a year by year basis. Um, uh, the operational uh, carbon will be near zero because the building will be flooded with uh, renewable energy. Our, our client is a renewable energy provider, um, so, so that helped us there. 
Um, the building itself was a kind of a listed building, so there were limited opportunities for the building to actually have uh, renewables on it. Uh, but we've put them on the, uh, on the roof lights where we can with um, thin film photovoltaics. So, so we've, we've worked quite hard at that, and it's, as I say, the, bas the basic is, basics is to reuse the building. Um, then, if we actually think about what we did inside, we've put a glue lamp and uh, a CLT uh, structure inside it for all the new flooring to fit it out because it was a, a great big vault of a space. Um, and that itself is negative in terms of carbon, and we're going to sequester about 1,600 tonnes of, of carbon in the uh, timber that has been put on the inside of it. Um, there is some new construction. It's underground because the building wasn't, um, the old building wasn't big enough in its own right. Um, and what that's led us to is, in comparison to perhaps a new build, um, if we focus on just the old building, a 40% life cycle reduction in terms of the uh, embedded carbon. And if you take the whole site, which includes the new, a 25% reduction. So these are really meaningful reductions. Um, um, that if we're all making these types of reductions now in buildings, then we're on a very, very good pathway uh, towards a one and a half or a two degrees um, future. Um, I think you mentioned earlier uh, social value. Um, and, um, you know, the, the direct uh, social value is, of course, the labour force that will be uh, um, in, in the building and the supply chain. Um, that relates to the kind of 800 jobs that will be created. But if you take wider induced jo jobs in the local economy, those that um, will now have, you know, the shopkeepers and uh, the other traders in the area, we think that that's going to be more like 1,400 jobs. So, again, a wonderful kind of gentrification and reinvigoration of the area creating um, a really beautiful destination, uh, new um, civic park available. Um, so really kind of exploiting the whole site, inviting the community onto the site where the, it's been a walled uh, off industrial building for, for a long time. Um, you mentioned um, a, a significant increase in net asset value. Um, and I think our, our clients are, are very optimistic that they will get a superior rent for this building in the, in the area in comparison to um, other buildings that they are. Um, and, you know, really a win-win situation, a win for the local community, um, um, a win for the uh, environment, um, and, and I'm sure um, a financial win for our, our clients. And, and that's the type of alignment that we really are looking for with, um, you know, the future buildings that we need, particularly in the de developed world, where we've got so many buildings that we can reuse again. Totally. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing all those numbers. I think our, we, our audience will, will be hearing those numbers and do the carbon accounting, but that's really fantastic. That is the sort of thinking that is going to deliver this, this action that the report is calling for, and it's great to see Foster and Partners taking on this leadership. It's really, really good, great case study in how we can deliver uh, the change we need. So I, now over to you, Rachel. The report, you know, well, covers a range of considerations when thinking about best and worst case scenarios and all about when, when it comes to climate change and how this affects our built assets. What strikes you as one of the most powerful findings that um, in this report, in that sense, uh, thanks, Christina. Uh, let me just start by also just sort of adding my thanks personally in terms of inviting me to, to speak at this event today. It's fantastic to actually see some of this thinking starting to come together and the collaboration that it involves and so on, which is brilliant. Um, I think I'd probably start, before we dive into the, the scenario side of things, I'd probably start by just reflecting on the fact that I've literally this week just finished um, a, a, an industry role as president of the Institution of Civil Engineers. I have spent the entire year with climate action as my theme, and it is absolutely crystal clear, because it just comes up time and time and time again, not just to do with the building side of things, but across all of these different infrastructure sectors all over the world, that we need an updated understanding of the proper, real business case, as you say, both financial and non-financial, in terms of understanding what it is we're actually trying to do and how we bring that through in practice. Um, of course, as you've been saying, we need to think about long-run outcomes. We need to make sure we've actually put the proper environmental and social lenses across everything we're doing because it is no good continuing with this short-run, lowest cost, you know, short, sharp <laughs> approach. It, it, is, it is simply not good in the context of COP26 and, and this Blue Zone event today and the bigger themes, but also just more generally in terms of the, the true meaning of sustainable investments we go forward. Um, I think 
as I sort of touched on just now, the bit where this also gets really interesting is that while from a GBC point of view, perhaps the primary focus to now has been on the buildings side of things and, and I guess the, sort of the, the real estate investment side of things, almost everything that's within this new report reflects across the whole of these infrastructure sectors yes. as well. And there is not very much translation required, actually, which is a nice, a nice place to find ourselves in terms of making sure that we, we really start to think about that. We've all got the same challenge. We've all got to think about whether we invest, where we invest, when we invest, how we invest, how much we invest, we've got to get to grips with what these, with these questions actually mean. And of course, we, we cannot just stop at creating a beautiful business case. We've then got to follow it through in terms of actually delivering on that business case as well and making sure we're tracking and we've got the right evidence and so on. And I suppose also that we're backing it up in due course with changes to procurement, to regulation and so on. So when it comes to the specifics of the scenarios, just, just briefly, I think the thing that jumps out for me is not so much the... The, the detail of when you look at the three degree or the one and a half degree scenario or the healthy or the unhealthy world scenario and so on, it's more the fact that the inputs and the assumptions that were made in terms of that thinking and the outcomes that we then are looking at in terms of the headlines of where the, where the world might be are of course intrinsically linked. And so the point for me is that the sooner we get on and invest towards the kind of world we actually want, the more chance we have of actually creating that world as a result of that investment. These things are not separate and, and somehow you know, independent variables. These are absolutely codependent in terms of how it goes forward. And I think, we, we, if we're honest, an awful lot of investment decision-making until almost now, really, and even going on still now in many parts of the world, has been really blind to an awful lot of these impacts. We simply haven't been taking them into account at all. And I think if we're being really brutally honest, we kind, of, we kind of know that, don't we? So what we need to start to do is to kind of take this no regrets strategy, in my view. We need to factor in the full cost, the full benefit of this investment over the whole life of whatever the thing is we're thinking about, because then actually we can expect more benefits to flow. And as I say, we have more chance in terms of that scenario analysis of ending up on the, in, in the correct column, if you like, or the best column that we might want to find ourselves right, in the future. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's so important, right? It's, it's the right sort of thinking, the, right, man, the man, uh, right mindset, no regrets investing, right? And, and I think uh, we've all learned our lessons, personal lessons uh, in, our, in our own institutions about the, the, the P word, right? And uh, it was what it's taught us, but it's really truly brought momentum and we're seeing it across at COP26, the big momentum that there is about doing What's, what's truly uh, demanded from us right now to keep the 1.5 degree scenario within reach. And we know, as we said, uh, this has to be part of this, of, this, of this journey. This sector has to be part of this journey. So James, I, you're there, but you're there. So I'm looking at the screen. Uh, the first time that World GBC released this report, the business case was balanced uh, between the, the, there was not really no, this social value proposition. And now we're finding this coming forward and we're balancing out also the financial and social value considerations. What do you feel that is, why is now the right time to bring this forward? Why this sort of investment makes sense for sustainable real estate? Yeah, I, Christine, I, I was loving what Rachel just said, you know, love this, we're trying to tackle the dual crisis of, of climate and inequality. These things have completely the same root causes. Ultimately, you know, if we say, you know, value just equals money, we create huge crisis, which, which threatens to completely engulf um, the economy when we don't value nature and people. Um, and if I, if I might say, you know, I think actually it's never been the right time not to include that agenda, but we're just kind of waking up to the, those points Rachel was just making about the interconnectedness of things. You know, we're getting this wrong because we as, we as humans see nature as something different. All, all this stuff is really, really interconnected. Um, but I think we're just at the start of building this field in the built environment where I think we're now starting to increasingly focus on, on deep, the deep emissions cut needed. It's still a relatively new field, this, you know, understanding how to deliver and measure social value. And I think it's a field we have to consciously build. Those of us who've been pushing a green agenda for decades um, now need to work with our, our colleagues who, who've been 
pushing you know social movements and, and a deep understanding of social issues and and really wonderful to see um, one of Laudis's other partners um IHRB and, and World GBC working together on this I think it's it's critical that we we build clarity around the field and it was only yesterday to, to look at the kind of importance of this agenda I was on the phone to a major investor launching a new impact fund their own clients saying actually we want to deliver social value but actually it's still unclear and um, what the kind of what the s in, the, in esg is is really about and um, we need to bring greater clarity to this field because there is increasing interest there's that understanding that these things are completely interconnected we can't can't be treating them somehow as separate but we've got a lot of work to do again around that, that point around the clearer narrative and um, on social value but also those points at where the points where social issues and issues that are caused by this deep decarbonization trajectory collide. I think we're just at the start of really understanding what uh, some of those issues are that threaten to really, quite frankly, massively trip us up uh, on the way to, to full decarbonisation if we don't grapple with them. And I think we're starting to also understand what, what does action look like on, on projects, you know, at, at the city scale? What does supporting actions with workers and communities actually start to starts to start to look like to embrace kind of social social outcomes? And I think also very critical in, in the context of COP and where policy is going, um, is that policy, as, as we're creating this, this kind of swathes of climate policy, that we have a much more inclusive decision-making process. Um, I've become familiar with the phrase recently, nothing about us without us. And I think it's kind of so incredibly obvious <laughs> when you say it, but um, you know, a lot of the, the kind of trajectories we're setting out now as we build climate policy for the sector, and um, it's really, really critical we're doing that with social value really at the forefront of our minds, not just as an add-on, because um, again, they threaten to really derail the whole transition um, if, if we don't have that front of mind. So fantastic the report is really embracing this agenda. Experts like um, IHRB and others are really being brought on board to help us propel this further faster. Yeah, thank you. And I guess that, that's, that's a good leeway into, into yes, we, we now have more climate action policy oriented. Not enough, but there's momentum behind it, right? We saw the figures this week about net zero ambitions from countries jumping to covering from being 50% of the world to 89% in just two days of this COP and hopefully we'll get much more as, as negotiations uh, finalize. But then this, oh, this report calls, you know, for that great, or it makes the case for greater demand for these solutions, right? And that's what we're hearing. There's that appetite, and we, we know it's right. However, what, it, maybe Maria Fernanda, do you think, how do you, would be your hope that this report helps you in your quest, possibly in bolder regulation, right, uh, from, from policymakers that can stimulate the conversation going forward? Um, yeah, it's very interesting, Christina, because um, we as Chile DBC um, participate, you know, in many, uh, in most of the, you know, public policy uh, related to climate change and, and to carbon in the in the built environment. And, and something that we have been noticed is that, um, you know, the, the private sector goes in some way in very, you know, forward and, and, and leading, you know, the move. But um, we need, you know, these policymakers and the public you know, the public sector to respond to this leadership. Um, so um, what I think is that, you know, this report that, uh, that you know, not only this report, but all the work that, uh, you know, the World Green Building Council along with it in, in all, you know, in all the world have been doing is that this has to be a very, um, important resource for the policymakers um, because we do not want policies you know that are like um, part of a specific government uh, because you know I think that you have known that um, we in Latin America have been going through a lot of you know uh, social crisis and, and, and economic crisis so we want this to be like an ethical issue for the governments um, and something that we, we have been noticing is that for example in, in governments in Latin America very specifically, you know, in Chile, is that the public policies are not responding to the um, SDGs. So, for example, uh, we do not have uh, public policies and roadmaps and strategies that include, for example, specific for the, the, the construction sector that include SDGs. So, um, and also, you know, that include more specific scenarios that was, you know, Rachel talking about before, um, more specific scenarios in terms of what is going to happen, you know, to our countries if we have, you know, um, 1.5 or 2 or 2.2, which is, um, we see like a huge disconnection 
uh, among the different sectors, also, you know, the investigation centers and the, the academics. So um, I think that this uh, report is a very important, you know, resource and a very important input to finally help to have this, uh, you know, uh, more strong articulation among the different sectors which are in, in, in one side, you know, in charge of the public policies and on the other hand, of the investigation and also to leading and the investment, you know, in more um, sustainable buildings and infrastructure and also making more sustainable cities. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I guess, I guess more than than build, more than bridging that disconnect is our kind of healing the disconnect, <laughs> no? Yeah. Because, because workers and, and 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 people are suffering the disconnect, right? There's lineal system thinking solutions where people have communities have not been involved are going to be impacted, ways of life, no expectations from different stakeholders being brought forward into the equation. I guess going going uh, to. Uh, Chris, what do you think would this report stimulate in terms of better regulation? What would be your your what would be on your Christmas list? Thank you for the question. I think the <laughs> um, I think one of the observations I would make, just amplifying what uh, what Maria has said, is I think policymakers find it much easier to bring forward policy and to advocate policy if there's real mm. examples that this is achievable. Yeah, and, yeah. and that they can point at that and then they have the case studies for it. So my, my, uh, yeah, my overriding ambition for this report is that it is, it is seen widely by policymakers. Um, they can look at the, uh, the multiple uh, examples in it. In fact, they can probably even ask for the multiple examples that didn't get into the report because there were so many in the first place. Um, and there are hard facts and figures and numbers there. Yes. Um, geographic spread. Um, uh, sectoral spread. Uh, there's there's almost no there's almost no place and no sector um, not touched by the report in one way or another. So I think um, um, it, it has to be of interest to policymakers, uh, and uh, we would really hope that they are going to positively move forward um, uh, and be inspired by what they can see that is actually going on. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of call for action and not talk. Uh, and every page of this uh, report is, is, is exactly full of that. It's full of action and not talk. So now, hopefully, our policymakers can pick it up and deliver on policy action on the back of it. Rachel, maybe you want something to add? I, yes, I, I guess I'm going to want to build on, on what we've just heard, really, from both Chris and Maria. So over the years, the vast majority of my work um, from a UK point of view has been with policymakers at national, regional, and local level, um, you know, all, all over the, the country in various different contexts. I think this is very much a two-way street, very much as we've just been hearing. Um, I think in order to take policy making out of the kind of the strategy and the idea stage and really land it in terms of real change and being able to commit to a policy that from a government perspective there is a confidence these things can actually be delivered, they need in return to know that the, the various sectors out there are ready to respond. It is not helpful to have policy that gets set where everyone says, well, I can't do that. So if what we're saying here is there is genuinely a business case, there, it, this is now almost into no-brainer territory in terms of, you know, it makes sense from all different points of view to, to make this, I guess, more right in terms of the current context and the technical understanding of what we're trying to do here. Actually, I think that the main thing we could do is to, is to really make sure that that sort of voice that noise is heard because then I think the level of confidence that we'll see coming back round the loop in terms of actually trying to go faster to go further should actually come through in practice and I would hope that that would be an approach that's echoed around the world as well. Fantastic. James, would you weigh in here? On, on policy makers, well I, th I think exactly what people have just said, you know, it's, it's critical business steps up and shows is actually what's possible so regulators aren't stepping into the void but you know Chris gave those brilliant examples now we can take action um, on the total climate impact of buildings we've been regulating on energy efficiency for, for, for years since the energy crisis it's time to tackle the total climate impact of buildings look at whole life cycle emissions in our regulations because otherwise we're only looking at part of the story and, and the science is clear that ain't going to be enough uh, and it's fantastic to see all the efforts being made by World GBC and your partners in the build-up um, to the cities, regions and built environment day to say very, very clearly, we've got to regulate this issue. Totally, cannot agree more. 
This was amazing. I do have a final question for you. I'm going to say some remarks. So first and foremost, I want to you acknowledge you in our audience, you there online. Thank you so much for, for being with us today, having these great insights from these thought-provoking uh, leaders. It's incredible to such, have such high caliber group joining us today discussing this critical issue. Yes, I think we're culminating our events, growing the momentum, keeping up the drumbeat as we go into cities, regions, and build environment day on the 11th of November. We're actually uh, convening policymakers on the stage. We're going to have cities, regions, leading CEOs from the private sector aligning with our collective voice behind the shared goals of keeping 1.5 degrees scenario within reach. We want to ditch that 3% scenario in the report. We must have emissions from the built environment by 2030 and totally decarbonized no later than 2050. So we have been very lucky at World GBC. We partnered with a great group of NGOs. We built up a coalition called Building to COP26. Hashtag, look it up, use it up, find out who we are. It is unprecedented collaboration from our industry and it has elevated the built environment at this COP to be more visible than ever before as a critical climate solution. So we hope the Beyond the Business Case report and the Beyond Buildings report that we launched last week are two pieces of work that will help you, will help us achieve that systemic shift in the built environment to address this so key issue of our time. And I can say there will be an incredible amount of initiatives and announcements happening all the way up to November 11th and including in November 11th, so keep an eye on that, which will help us and propel us to achieve that net zero vision of equitable and resilient built environments too. So I really thank you all for joining us today and I do count on your collaboration in and beyond COP26 for a sustainable built environment for everyone everywhere. But to close, a final question to our panelists. So ahead of that monumental week we're going to have, be having in a, few, in a few days' time, what would be your pitch for why the world can't afford not to invest in a sustainable built environment? Imagine you're yesterday, two days ago in the world, in the world leaders forum. You have one sentence. What's your pitch? Maria Fernanda. Wow, it's an ethical issue. We are talking about people's lives. We're talking about people's lives. Chris? Well, we are talking about people's lives and we're talking about the life of a fragile planet and uh, it's common to us all, so we have to take it super seriously. James? 38% of global emissions. <laughs> Why the heck are we not tackling it with more energy? <laughs> Oh, yes, we feel you. Rachel? Um, so I would have a sentence in three very brief parts. Uh -huh. The first bit is we will not get a better chance than right now to make this change because of COVID. We've already changed pretty much everything. We've learned we can change. We just need to carry on. Second is we've seen the problem. There is no excuse, exactly as we just heard there. And, and I guess the third thing is we are already on this knife edge in terms of the, the, the uncertainty. And, and I guess that knife edge is actually sharpening and getting sort of steeper, if, if you kind of pardon the slightly strange analogy there, as time goes on. So if we're not careful, our choices in this space will be limited and we will be forced into survival mode as opposed to creative community building mode. That is not where we want to be. No, at all. That's great. All said, thank you very much for joining us today in a big round of applause for our speakers. Thank you.